Hello, how are you? Welcome to our today's class on basic biochemistry, where we're going to do introduction into chemistry that is related to anatomy and physiology. If you're new here, my name is Winnie Barawa and this is Medic Academy, where we discuss all sectors of health, basing it from biology, anatomy, biochemistry, nursing, medicine, physiotherapy, base it all because the knowledge we share is simply most of the time the same. So you can subscribe to our channel and don't miss out on our classes. Just click on the notification button so that we get to the next class. You'll be notified as the first person. Thank you and keep it here. So by introduction, biochemistry is generated from basic elements. And by elements, we mean substances made of only one type of an atom. And atoms could be of types such as hydrogen, iron, oxygen, calcium, nitrogen, and carbon. There are different types of elements, and they are very, they are wide and various of it all. But the basic of it that we commonly use in biology are the calcium, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and so on. So let's start with atom by definition. This is the smallest part of an element and it will have to present with characteristics of that element. So atom is made of three major subunits or particles and these subunits include the proton, neutrons and the electron. So in the study of biochemistry, you will not miss the words elements, you will not miss the words atoms. And for this purpose, you need to understand the structure of an atom that is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So this is how the atomic structure looks like, where we have the nucleus, which is the central part of the atom. Here we are using the carbon atom as an example, so do not be a bit confused. So the nucleus is the central part of the atom and it's made up of protons and neutrons. The nucleus again is surrounded by structure we call the orbit. So in the orbit, it contains the parts we call the electron. So the electron, this is a subunit that surrounds the nucleus and it rotates on the orbit. I hope that makes sense. So most diagram will draw it in this way. So this is the nucleus here with proton and neutrons. And then we have the electrons, right? And then we have the orbit. So the electron rotate around the orbit. This structure will let us see that originates what you call the energies. And those energies are very important when it comes to chemical bonding. In other places, you'll find the structure appearing like this one here where we have, you know, the orbit, the electrons surrounding it, the nucleus at the middle with the neutrons Starting with and the, the protons. protons. The protons so are the characteristics to be of positively part of charged this neutron and, and they are this found to be part of the nucleus. And then the neutrons, it is and does not have a charge and it, has a, and it is found in the nucleus of the atom also. The electrons have a negative charge and they're found in the orbit of the nucleus. So it's being said that the number and the arrangement of the electrons will give our atom the bonding capabilities. So the bonding capabilities originate from the order of our electrons, such that where there's free electrons, they're the ones who will participate in creating or in helping us create a bond. That, that means creating a bond with other atoms so that we can generate what we call a molecule. So a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms. So a molecule, what is it now that we've mentioned it? So a molecule is a combination of two or more atoms brought together by a bond. So for example, here we have the water molecule. And the water molecule is a combination of two hydrogen atoms combining to an oxygen atoms. So in this case, if you look at the electrons of these two, of these uh, atoms here, we'll say the electrons, how they are organized, are the ones that will generate for us, right, the bonds. So there are different types of bonds that I'll show you later. And in this case, 
a hydrogen will bond to the free electrons of the oxygen and another hydrogen will bond to the free electrons of the oxygen to give us two covalent bonds will finally give us the water molecules which we most of the time like to call it the H2O or in other words water. So this is the water molecule here. So we have the first water molecule here and another water molecule here where we have the hydrogen and oxygen bonding covalently. Now, water has its own characteristics and water molecules, they normally also attach to each other, but the bond that is used to attach water molecule to another water molecule, we call that bond a hydrogen bond. It's a very... Weak bond can easily be broken by changing temperatures, like during boiling, this bond can easily be broken and the water can start to evaporate. So water molecules, like we said, it's a combination of uh, atoms through bonds, different types of bonds, and they is, is facilitated with the different electrons on the orbits. So where there's a free electron, that's the one that will bond with the other free electrons from the other atom to give us the different bonds. But like I said, we will do bonds in the next in the next slides. So yeah, here are chemical bonds. So we've been mentioning these bonds and saying the free electrons, they go together with other free electrons and give us these chemical bonds. So bond is simply a force or an ultra attraction between positive and negative charges that are able to keep our atoms closely together to give us the molecule. So there are Four major bonds that we should know, although there are other bonds, like in the DNA, we find different bonds that get to be formed based on the uniqueness of a chemical reaction. However, with the chemical bonds, we have these four common ones here. Ionic covalent, the sulfide, and the hydrogen bond. So, starting with the ionic bond. So, the ionic bond, this is a bond that is created whereby a loss of electron by one atom and there's a gain of this electron by another atom such that we have two types of ions being generated one being called cation and the other one being called anion so having two atoms whereby we need to form an ionic bond where one atom needs to lose their free electron and another atom needs to gain the lost electrons forming a bond but is contained by two types of atoms ions here sorry a cation and an ion a cation we say this is an ion that is positively charged like sodium ion calcium most of the time these are positively charged ions mostly they form bonds by losing well an ion these are negatively charged ions for example the chloride or the carbonates where they form bonds by gaining so we're being told that in cases of salts, acids, and bases, most of these compounds, they form ionic bonds. And by this, we mean these are components that can easily dissolve in water. So an ion, ionic bonds are known to break easily when they are put in water. That's why when you put salts, acid, and bases, they can easily dilute in water because they are made of ionic bonds and these are easy to dissociate or to break down. So here's an example of our ionic bonding process taking place. So where the sodium is losing to become positively charged and the chloride will gain the lost electron to become negatively charged. So we have a bond that is holding these two here, forming the sodium chloride, but one is negatively charged, another one is positively charged. So in this case, the sodium will be the cation, and the chloride will be the anion. So that's what we mean by an ionic bond. One atom loses, the other atom gains. The one that loses becomes positively charged, calling it cation. The one that gains becomes negatively charged, and you are calling it anion. See? Super easy. Covalent bonds. So a covalent bond, it's a bond that is formed where the ions share electrons so here none is losing and none is gaining but the process involves sharing of the electrons so in the process where a covalent bond is forming the atoms involved will share the electrons forming what you are calling the covalent bond so for example in the oxygen gas and and uh, water molecules 
the atoms there are covalently bonded. So let's start with, uh, let's use carbon dioxide as an example. So with carbon dioxide, we have the carbon, which is the common atom here, that will share its electron with the oxygen atoms to give us carbon dioxide. However, we need to know that co covalent bonds are not weak bonds and they will not dissolve in aqueous solution. Aqueous here, we mean water solutions. So if you put carbon dioxide in water, it's not going to break down. It will not dissolve in aqueous solution because covalent bonds are not weak bonds. They do not easily dissociate in aqueous solutions. And then the third bond is our disulfide bond or also called the disulfide bridge. So disulfide bonds is also said to be a special kind of a covalent bond. However, the special part of it is that this involves sulfur atoms, mostly found in proteins, for instance, the cysteine proteins. So with proteins that contain sulfur, they bond using the sulfur proteins. I mean, the sulfur atoms in this case to give us a three-dimensional shape for these particular proteins. Good examples are the cysteines, keratin, insulins, and antibodies. All these are types of proteins. So to bond these proteins, they need to bond at their level of sulfur atoms. So here's our sulfur and the bond that is joining this sulfur or these two sulfurs, is, we are calling them the disulfide bond or the disulfide bridge. So this is a type of a covalent bond that is allowing the bonding of two sulfur atoms that are found in a protein. So the bond between two sulfur atoms, we call it a disulfide bond or also a disulfide bridge. Hydrogen bond, the last bond. So with hydrogen bond, this is an attraction, also said to be a covalent bond, but it is a special bond which is known to only bond a hydrogen to either an oxygen or to a nitrogen. So a hydrogen bond, special type of a covalent bond also, but it occurs in a special instances where a hydrogen needs to attach to an oxygen or this hydrogen needs to attach to a nitrogen. You'll find them mostly with water molecules where the hydrogen in the water molecule needs to bond to an oxygen part in the other water molecule. So in this case, the bond will be a hydrogen bond. Mostly these are formed when you need to create three-dimensional shapes, either in proteins or also in nucleic acids, but mostly this bond is very weak can easily be broken or can easily dissociate and separate the molecules. So that's what we mean by hydrogen bonds. All right. Where there's a bond, partly the bond can break and the bond can also release energy during these activities. So processes where there is change that can lead to breaking or forming of bonds is what we call chemical reactions. So a chemical reaction is a process that allows formation or breaking of chemical bonds. So we have three major chemical reactions in our body. And these are the combinations, decompositions, and displacement. Combination is also known as synthesis reactions. Synthesis reactions are said to be chemical reactions that allow bonds to be formed and requires us to form a new compound. So a synthesis or a combination, it's a process that allows formation of bonds where two or more molecules are coming together to give us a new compound. So now this, this process requires energy. So combination are processes that require energy because we are forming two, a bond. So we need to pull together these molecules to come together and attach. And this will require energy. However, in the other reaction that we call decompositions, here, the bonds are broken from a molecule to release those molecules apart. So now in the process where we are breaking the bonds, they say this process releases energy. So with decomposition, for example, here, let's, let's assume people are in love and they need to split apart. So in the process of decomposition, it's more of like breaking apart or breaking off. And in this process, there's energy being released. So this process releases energy. 
And the last category of a chemical reaction, we call it the displacement. Displacement. So with displacement, uh, we talk about where a new molecule displaces or removes another molecule and takes their place. So here's an example, right? Okay, this is a bad, um, the, uh, this is not the best I could have used, but it brings the, uh, which brings the narrative clear. We have a new molecule here that needs to join this partnership. So as a result, you need to displace. So the blue one is being displaced. Sad, but reality. So the blue one will get to be displaced and the green one takes the position. So in this case, it means with displacement, mostly it's a case where there's no compatibility and as a result, needs to bring in molecules to bring the compatibility. So one has to be displaced. Mostly also this requires a release of energy and also use of energy. So it combines both. But the main reactions, we have combination, decomposition, and displacement. So if you like our work, kindly keep on liking this channel and liking our videos, but also comment. I really, really like comments that can build on like what next we should be discussing or revising on but also share around your circles and people that can join our classes and remember to subscribe like put your thumb there and get to be notified when we post our next classes thank you so much and bye bye see you in our next class